special treat today. Uh, our speaker tonight is a guru in the C++ community. He's the author of uh, Effective C++, More Effective C++, and Effective STL. He graduated uh, with a PhD in computer science from Brown University and is the consulting editor for Addison Wesley's Effective Software uh, Development Series. I'd like you to well, join me in welcoming Scott Myers. Turnout for free pizza. <laughs> when I was working on my PhD, one of my goals was to make sure I spent at least as much time on the research as I did on typesetting the document itself. So when I was putting this presentation together, I decided I was going to try to play around a little bit with multimedia capabilities in PowerPoint, which I had never done before. So one of my goals was to make sure I did not spend more time playing around with the multimedia capabilities as I did with the actual research itself, which it turned out, as you shall see, was not terribly difficult to do because of the unbelievable amounts of time I spent on the research accomplishing something that can be described in about 45 minutes. Um, I'm going to be showing three clips from movies tonight, and already I see I've got a really big problem. The big problem I have is one of the movies is rated R. You have to turn around. <laughs> the first movie clip. Anybody else, you know, who's not 18 or with a parent or guardian, you gotta turn around for the first movie clip. I'm sorry, didn't mean to do that. But as a bonus, um, for the first person to be able to correctly identify the movie clip, um, we're giving away my stuff since apparently we don't sell it any longer. So, <laughs> Um, so we got a copy of each one of my books, a copy of the CD. This is a special CD because it doesn't work with contemporary browsers, but it doesn't tell you that on the packaging. <laughs> it may work with somewhat reduced functionality. Um, if there is a tie for who is able to claim the books, then I will break the tie in an arbitrary fashion, either by having you pick a number that I'm thinking of, or by answering a trivia question from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, depending on... <laughs> came from, you are like in first place already. <laughs> um, here's the talk. It's called Red Code, Green Code, Generalizing Const. Uh, there's a reason, which I hope will be fairly clear by the end, why I call it two-thirds. Um, and it is, at this point, um, I think a proof of concept. So uh, I think it's interesting. Const acts like a code constraint in the sense that you can call from non-const code into const code, and that's fine. You can't call from const code into non-const code unless there is an explicit syntactic indication, which is a fancy way of saying unless you do a cast. It is easy to imagine other kinds of constraints on code that we would like to have automatically enforced by the compiler. We can imagine, for example, saying this is thread safe code and this is unthread safe code, and it's okay to go from unthread safe code to thread safe code, but you shouldn't be able to go the other direction without some kind of syntactic indication, the more morally equivalent of a cast. You shouldn't be able to go from exception safe code to exception unsafe code without the moral equivalent of cast. If I understand the uh, lesser of public license, you probably don't want to go from LGPL code, which essentially is open source, which is open source, into un-LGPL code, because that would make the code you call LGPL. It would make it open source. But it's okay to call into LGPL code from proprietary code. That doesn't make it open source. But we can imagine a large number of constraints like this. So this is my goal. I want to automatically enforce arbitrary user-defined collections of code constraints where they can mean anything you want to. So that's the plan. Now, when I first started thinking about this problem, which was three or four years ago, um, I originally started thinking about namespaces, as it turns out. And I said, let's imagine that we have a green namespace and it has some function inside of it. The idea is that green code is constrained. There's nothing dangerous about going into green code. It's constrained in some ways, the equivalent of const code. And then we've got red code, and red code is dangerous. You don't want people to get into red code accidentally. But to go from red code into green code is perfectly fine. So we can imagine putting the namespace green inside the namespace uh, red. In which case, if I'm in a green function here and I call red function, this will not compile. 
But if I explicitly say red colon colon, red font well, then that's okay. I've syntactically indicated this is a transformation I wish to allow. But if I'm inside, pardon me? Um, actually, I can't give it to me again. It's way too complicated. Thank you. <laughs> well, he asked, can you turn it on? Answer, no. If you're in the red function, then you can call the green function. No cast is required there because it's okay to go from red code to green code. And in fact, when I, when I came up with this AI, I was very impressed with myself. I thought, this is kind of cool because I thought, this is the first time I've ever seen an application of namespaces that has nothing to do with partitioning code into sections. It's, it's sort of, um, a, we're trying to achieve some other goal. There are problems with this approach. Uh, it doesn't help at all with global functions. And you might want to be able to say a global function is thread safe or is not thread safe. It doesn't help at all because of the charming thing we have, um, ADL, argument dependent lookup, where you can be warped from one namespace into another namespace simply by virtue of using a particular parameter from a different namespace. And it also turns out that namespaces have to properly nest inside one another, but we want to have arbitrary combinations of code. So I want to be able to have, for example, thread safe code, call code that is thread safe and is also LGPL and also exception safe. And when I tried to think about how to mix my namespaces so that those kinds of combinations would be allowed, it didn't look like that was going to pan out. So I said, well, all right, I need to have some different approach to this. So then I started thinking about the way that Barton and Knackman enforce um, dimensional analysis of physical units. And they use template metaprogramming um, and TMP is template metaprogramming, which seems sort of like a promising way to do it because you could hang an arbitrary set of constraints in some way through template metaprogramming. The problem is that Barton and Ackman always have objects, and objects can have types associated with them, but what I wanted to do was to associate this kind of information with functions. And it wasn't clear to me how I could somehow take that idea and use it with functions. So then I thought a little harder, and I said, well, all right, what about enable if? I can use enable if, and enable if will allow me to say, if the following condition is true during compilation, using fancy template stuff, then this template should be considered for overload resolution. And if this condition is not satisfied, it should not be considered for overload resolution, which seemed promising. Basically, if the constraints are satisfied, you can call this template. If the constraints are not satisfied, you can't call this template. But that's not really what I want to say, because the problem is that what enable if does is if you can't, if the constraint is not satisfied, then enable if actually removes that template from the set of overloaded functions you will consider calling. That's not what I want. I don't want to say, if the constraint is satisfied, go ahead and call it, but if the constraint's not satisfied, pretend like it's not there. What I want to say is, figure out which function to call, and once you've figured out which function to call, then check to make sure that the constraints are satisfied. And enable if doesn't let me do that. So that didn't seem terribly promising. Well, so then I started thinking about traits. And I said, OK, I can imagine having traits which will associate information with a particular function. But I couldn't think of any way that would allow me to say, this particular function, which is really just an address, this particular function should map to this set of traits. So. That was kind of a problem. I also wasn't wild about the fact that even if I used traits, I'd have the body of the function in one part of the code. I'd have the trait information in some other location in the code. And then there'd always be the problem of trying to keep the two of them in sync, which sort of didn't appeal to the software engineer in me. So I really wasn't very happy with any of these choices, but I did notice that all of them have a common theme, which is template metaprogramming. So that made me think that Maybe there was something about playing games with templates and metaprograms would allow me to do what I wanted to be able to do. So my second approach, after rejecting namespaces, was to say, this is what I'm going to do. A constraint will be represented by a type. If you have some new constraint, whatever it happens to be, the constraint could be, code has been reviewed by Scott. You just create a type to represent that constraint. This is not a new idea. This actually is exactly what we do with STL iterator categories. So if you're familiar with um, input iterator tag, output iterator tag, random access iterator tag, those structs have no types, they have no data, they have no functions. They exist simply to represent the existence of an idea. 
So that was the first idea, it was just empty structs to represent the existence of a constraint. A function can have multiple constraints. Thread safe would be a constraint. Exception safe would be a constraint. LGPL would be a constraint. Produced by the programmers in building 40 or 41 or whatever building we're in right now could be a constraint. Doesn't matter what it is. We can have a set of these or a collection of these and that will be the set of constraints for that function. In which case, it's okay to go from a caller to a callee if and only if the constraints on the caller is a subset of the constraints on the callee. And I want you to admire the special symbol here because it took me minutes to find that in PowerPoint. <laughs> Everyone should really be admiring my use. Actually, I don't even know if that's the right symbol, but I did spend a lot of time finding it. And I want to use template metaprogramming to enforce this during compilation. In the same way that const correctness is enforced during compilation, I want arbitrary constraint correctness to be enforced during compilation. Now, I've got to say about template metaprogramming. So this is the first film clip. Cover your eyes. We'll see if this works. use 
is an MPL set. I really want to have a set of constraints, and if I were to put, say, reviewed in twice, it's still only reviewed one time, but, well, we'll talk about MPL set later on. So that's the basic plan. So now, from a caller's perspective, you have two different ways that you can call functions. So here is some function g that wants to call f. Now, we're following the basic rule. Every function that wants to participate in this scheme has a, a type def called my constraints. So it declares its type def called my constraints with whatever its constraints are. And then it calls f passing my constraints. And then through magic that I will show you, the call e will be responsible for verifying that the constraints are correct. Alternatively, another approach you can take, and they both work, is to declare an extra parameter that is caller constraints. And then at the call site, I don't actually have to use angle brackets. Instead, I can pass an anonymous unnamed object of this type, which the compiler will then use for template argument deduction to figure out what the constraints are up here. So this is purely a syntactic thing. In this case, you have to explicitly pass the type argument. In this case, the compiler will figure out the type argument. That's the only difference between those two. So every function declares a type def called my constraints, and when they want to call another function, they pass this either explicitly as a parameter to the template or using implicit type deduction. So fairly straightforward, I hope. We need to have some way to override the type checking, sort of the moral equivalent of const cast. So there's a couple of things you can do. The first thing is you can pass something which is ignore constraints. Ignore constraints is simply a type def which I've already provided. So ignore constraints is an MPL vector which has no types inside, which means it is zero constraints. Code with zero constraints can call anything. It's an unconstrained function. So this is, so if you pass um, if you pass ignore constraints, that is a way of saying, I want to call this function even if it's not necessarily type safe. That's one thing you can do. The other thing you can do is, let's suppose that you have many constraints. I'm thread safe, I'm exception safe, I'm reviewed. And you want to call a, another template, but it's not thread safe. But the other two things it is. See, what you really want to do is essentially cast away the thread safe constraint for that one call only. Well, under those conditions, you get to use uh, a function called erase val. So here's G. So G could say, I want to call F passing ignore constraints. This will always compile. Or I can say, I want to take my constraints and I want to remove thread safe from it by calling erase val. And when you get into the template, to the uh, metaprogramming library, template functions that execute during compilation on types are known as meta functions. That's what they call them. So erase val is a meta function. And I'll be showing you how that's implemented shortly. So this shows you how, as a caller, you can either just pass your normal set of constraints or you can modify your set of constraints for a particular call. So this is that syntactic indication I was talking about earlier. Now, for callees, they're responsible for checking to make sure that the constraints have actually been enforced. So here's a callee again. It's type def for my constraints. And all they have to do is invoke the meta function called includes. And I'll show you how that's implemented. This just says that the constraints of the callee contain all of the constraints of the caller. And I'm using boost MPL assert, which is a assertion which is executed during compilation. I could use boost's static assert. You may be familiar with that as well. The main difference is that boost static, well, the, the difference for purposes here is that boost's static assert in many cases does not generate error messages that are as nice as this. Let me rephrase that. Boost's MPL assert error messages are ugly and more useful than Boost static asserts messages, which are simply ugly. 
<laughs> I don't want to mislead you into thinking that we're talking about a thing of beauty here at some point. Um, I mean, it has the desired effect of not compiling, but they're both a handful. Uh, but Boost MPL Assert actually it spits out some asterisk and stuff, so it, it actually, it's visually, when you look at it, you can see right away, oh, okay, this is an assertion failure. Whereas with Boost Static Assert, you're not quite clear whether it was an assertion failure or instead it's just one of those error messages that you got from template processing and you're not really quite sure what the problem is. So that's the advantage of that. So basically, uh, callers just pass their constraints. Callees simply assert that the constraints of the callee are contained in the constraints of, excuse me, of the caller are contained in the constraints of the callee. So this is sort of the user interface we're looking at. Now, there's no includes meta function, um, so I had to write one myself. So this is the includes meta function. I think the code is transparent and obvious. Are there any questions? <laughs> So, sup is a collection of types that's supposed to be the superset. Sub is a collection of types that's supposed to be a subset. They both act like STL containers. So, includes is true. Notice that we're calling find if, and then here's an end down here. Basically, what we want to know is, if I call find if, does it return the end iterator? So this, uh, the superset includes the subset if, find if, what it returns is the same as end. So now we're reduced to saying, okay, what is find if doing? Well, find if is the sequence it's going to be searching is the, the, uh, the, the subset. Now, I hope you know what find if in the STL does. It searches every element of a container looking for the first one that satisfies a particular predicate. We're doing exactly the same thing. We're walking a collection of types looking for the first type that satisfies a particular predicate. So the predicate in this case is what I want to know is whether the superset contains the element I am currently looking at. Under bar 1 is a placeholder for whatever element in the alleged subset I'm currently looking at. And what I want to know is if that's not true. Because what I'm hoping is that I'm never going to find, I'm always going to find that element. Any questions on how that works? Now, in my experience, this only takes about four hours to get right. <laughs> but that's only because I was able to post to the Boost mailing list and get help from several people. <laughs> I'll be talking about, well, actually, I'll be showing you a film clip about working with the Meta Programming Library shortly. Still spent more time on the research than on the film clips. Uh, this is erase val. Now, what I needed was a meta function that would take a container of types and would erase every occurrence of a particular type in it. There's no meta function that does that in the MPL, at least there's not one that I know of. Now, originally I had been hoping not to have to write this, but I'll get to that in a moment. So erase file does this. So it does have copy if, which is kind of interesting because the STL itself doesn't have copy if. <coughs> but then again, this is easier to read than remove copy if, which is what the STL does have. So we take the sequence, and what I want to know is if the thing I'm looking at is the same as the type T, uh, then I want. Excuse me. If it's not the same as T, I want to copy it. So basically, I'm going to copy all the types into a new container, <laughs> except the ones that are the same as T. Any questions about how that works? When I was originally working with the MPL, I was trying to use set, because with set I could just erase a key and all copies would automatically be gone because it is a set. So I type in my program, which was about this long, and it doesn't do the right thing. So I type in some variation and it doesn't do the right thing. And I type in some variation and it doesn't do the right thing. And I'm looking at, I'm thinking, you know, what's, what's the problem here? So finally, in desperation, 
I post to the Boost mailing list and I say, look, all I want to do is take a set and erase an element from the set. Now, how hard can this be? I must be an idiot. So I show the code that I'm writing and say, what am I doing wrong? And the next morning I get up and there is mail in the mail list from Dave Abrahams, co-author of the metaprogramming library, who says, clearly you're not doing anything wrong. It's just a bug in the metaprogramming library. <laughs> New user. <laughs> Never used this thing before. <laughs> See, this is the problem, is because from that point forward, how many people remember the first time you ever found a bug in your compiler? How many people remember that moment? Okay, either you've not been using the same compiler as I have, or you have really bad memories. <laughs> All I can tell you is after I found that my compiler could have bugs in it, from that point forward for at least two weeks, I was perfect. <laughs> Anything that did not work was clearly a bug in the compiler. <laughs> second most depressing thing I ever found out about programming. Number, number two, second most depressing thing. Compilers are programs and I have bugs. Most depressing thing. Number one, debuggers are programs. <laughs> Just because it says x is equal to 5 doesn't necessarily mean x is equal to 5. I complained to my office mate. He goes, well, Scott, stop putting bugs in your code. Which actually is fairly good advice if you think about it. Okay, uh, this is a longer film clip, but it's not R-rated, so you can watch this one. Uh, this is, in my experience, my experience. What it has been like to program with the MPL. I'm going to have to tell you what's trying to go on here. Uh, this is the metaprogramming library. <laughs> That's me. <laughs> I'm trying to feed the MPL a program. <laughs> No, it really is just like this. <laughs> yeah, see, the MPL is strong, but I am stronger. <laughs> see? 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 Okay, F success, right? <laughs> Me. <laughs> Anybody know what movie that is? The Miracle Worker. The name of the movie is The Miracle Worker. Yeah, that's Ann Sullivan, the actress is Ann Bancroft. Who said The Miracle Worker? Okay. Can I, can I give you a book? Sure. <laughs> sure? I've got them, but I evangelize. So. <laughs> Which book can I give you? Is that the second edition there? I'll take more. I like lose that a second. Yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> Jesus, it's like talking to the NPL. All right. The first book, I don't want your book. The second book, what edition is that? <laughs> okay, so um, where were we besides having food spit back in our faces? with what we've talked about so far. Users define a type for every constraint that they need. Pretty straightforward, pretty easy to do, pretty easy to understand, I think. Every function is going to be a template, and by convention it takes a parameter, which I call a caller constraint, but it's got to have some template argument. Yeah? Are you concerned that that's going to make multiple copies of the same function? Okay, the question is, am I concerned that's going to make multiple copies of the same function? At this point, I am not concerned. And I can say that because, remember the proof of concept? <laughs> okay? Oh, well, actually, the two-thirds is something different. It turns out we've only done one-third. Um, but to answer your question, that's not something I'm concerned about. But if I were worried about really doing this, I probably would have to be. Um, every function has a my constraints type def, which it passes to callers, and everybody has this assertion in it. 
which I think is fairly straightforward. You can probably write a macro or something to do a lot of this kind of stuff. Anybody have any idea what this means? I mean, does that mean like it's a really bad idea? <laughs> bulb's dying on the projector. What's that? The projector's bulb is dying. Uh, that's the international icon for the projector's bulb is dying. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a bad idea. Is, is there an ISO standard? Never mind. All right. Okay, but so far I've only talked about the easy case. I didn't talk about pesky little things like virtual functions. Virtual functions. We go to the Boost Spirit documentation where it says the virtual function is the metaprogrammer's hell. It is an opaque wall where no metaprogram can get past. It kills all meta function information beyond the virtual function call. It goes on to point out the reason for this is virtual functions can't be templates. I want to check virtual functions too. We have another movie. This one's very short. You have to listen. Style. The word, sir, the word is no. I am therefore going anyway. After having the damn thing spit on me, I was not going to be stopped just because I couldn't pass any meta information. Anybody know what movie this is? Star Trek 3. Somebody ever got that? Star Trek 3? Yeah, Star Trek. You said, uh, can, can I give you a movie? Yes. I, I mean, I don't have a movie, actually. <laughs> Please, can I give you one of these? I would love one. Which one? The book? Okay. For some reason, nobody wants the non-functional CD. <laughs> <laughs> Pardon me? Did you ask who already has this? Who already has the CD? <laughs> Pardon me? Amazing they didn't repress it. Such... All right. It used to work. Honest. Um, okay. You know, I'm not going to be stopped just by some pesky, opaque wall. Um, so I got to think, there's, there's two ways I can think about getting past this pesky problem of virtual functions. Um, one of them is NVI, the non-virtual interface idiom, and since Herb Setter's in the room, he's the one who publicized that. Basically, if we always call virtual functions, through a non-virtual wrapper interface. Then I can do the testing of the constraints in the non-virtual function. And in fact, this is also semantically sound because the constraints advertised by a virtual function in the base class interface also apply to the derived implementation. So if I tell my callers, OK, this is a thread safe, exception safe function, when a derived class implements that, it had better still be thread safe and exception safe. That's part of the contract. So it's completely legitimate to test that in the base class non-virtual function before calling the virtual function, before calling the virtual function itself. So that's one approach. But there's another approach, which is to say, actually, at this point, since we've run into this opaque wall where no metaprogram can get past, we're just going to switch horses. Instead of going from template metaprogramming, we're going to start going to RTTI. I mean, it's just sitting there. So that's the basic situation. Um, I have a slide here on NVI, which I'm not going to bother to go through anymore. Um, I want to go on to checking virtuals through runtime type information. Now, this was my original idea. My original idea was, if I have an object that represents the constraints for F, where it inherits from every one of those constraint classes, and I have an object that represents all the constraints for some function g, which means it inherits from all of the appropriate constraint classes there. Now I've got these two objects. They both have potentially multiple base classes. Now I can do RTTI, and I can find out whether the caller's bases are contained in all of the call e's bases. So in this case here, g, which has constraints c2 and c3, should be able to call f, because f also has c2 and c3, even though f has some more. But f should not be able to call g, because f has constraints like c1 that g does not have. The only problem is, I was not able to think of a way to implement the code. If I have some random object and some other random object, I don't know how to write the code to say, can I dynamically cast this to all the base classes of this? Because I have no way to ask, what are all your base classes? 
That seemed like kind of a dead end. So then I said, all right, how about this? I can use template metaprogramming to generate a function which will contain dynamic casts to all of the base classes. And during compilation, I know what my base classes are because during compilation, I've got that my constraints list. So that seemed like an idea. Problem. Only the caller knows what base class it's dynamically cast to. Only the caller knows what its constraints are. There is no way for the caller to get the constraints for the callee. If I'm going to call some function, there's no way for me to say to that function, so function, what are your constraints? I don't know how to do that. So the caller can't get the constraints from the callee to check. And there's no way for the callee to get the caller's constraints during compilation, because this is a virtual function. Remember, opaque wall, no meta information can pass. So this is my basic idea. We have a base class called caller base. It's not a template. All callers will, actually, I'm going to now have an object that represents the constraints of the caller. All such objects will be of a type that inherits from caller base, which is not a template. I will have another object that represents the constraints of the call E. All such objects will inherit from call E base, which is not a template. The caller base class has one virtual function. It happens to be called R included by. I will talk more about that in a moment. I can then dynamically create, excuse me, I can create, dynamically is a bad word because this is all happening during compilation. I can then create during compilation using template metaprogramming a derived class, which I'm going to call caller constraints object, which is templatized by my constraints. This derived class will redefine the virtual function it inherits from the base class. And inside this virtual function, it knows which constraints it has to obey. It's passed as a template argument, which means I can generate code for that function to dynamically cast to every one of those base classes. So I'm going to generate the code for all the dynamic casts during compilation by passing in a list of the classes that have to be cast to. A constraint object for the call E will inherit from all of its constraints at runtime. I am going to pass a callee object to the virtual function of the caller object, which will then make a virtual function call to come down into this class here. So now I'm inside the implementation of a function in this derived class. This derived class has now been passed one of these objects, which means I can perform dynamic casts on it. And this function here knows all of the constraints that must be cast to, which means it can do the dynamic casting. Any questions about the basic idea? Because I'm not going to be showing you all the code in detail, although I can make it available to you. Yes? That's correct. So the, co the comment is that because I have gone from the compile time realm to the runtime realm, and I'm using dynamic cast, if a constraint violation is detected, it will now be a runtime error, not a compile time error. That's correct. So I'm curious, why did you choose this approach and not the, uh, the wrapping approach to see if you can do a compile time error? Okay, so the question is basically, why did you choose this rather than the NVI approach? Yeah. Um, for what it's worth, I implemented both of them. And the, the advantage of doing this is that if a derived class does decide to change its constraints in such a way that it violates the contract, this can detect that 
And also, I just wanted to see if I could do it, <laughs> to be brutally honest. Okay? Um, I like the idea, in the same way that I showed you two syntaxes earlier for calling, where you either pass a caller constraints object parameter and do implicit type deduction, or you explicitly use the angle bracket notation and pass the constraints that way. There's basically two interfaces. This is a similar kind of decision. You either um, use NVI, or you use this depending on pretty much taste more than anything else. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Can these be layered so that you get the, the compile time error, and then you also get the protection of the RTTI? Sure. I mean, the question is, can you combine and do both of these things? Yeah, you can. But, or more precisely, I cannot think of any reason why you cannot. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for what it's worth, the inspiration for this is the way that Boost's shared pointer is implemented. And if you happen to be familiar with how Boost's shared pointer implements custom deleters, this will look very familiar. And if you are not familiar with how Boost's shared pointer implements custom deleters, number one, it looks like this. And number two, I encourage you to take a look at that because I think it's really a very interesting technique. I have to modify my constraint types now so that they can be dynamically cast. So I've got to give them all virtual, function, virtual functions. I chose to give them virtual destructors. They don't do anything, but I need to have some way of doing dynamic cast. So here is call E base. It just has a virtual destructor to support the uh, dynamic cast. So I'm going to be passed um, a, actually I don't even remember now whether it's a pointer or a reference. Knowing me, it's probably a reference uh, to one of these, which I'm then going to try to cast to these guys over here. Actually, I'm going to this will be castable to any of these types over here. And if that's the correct set of types, the code will run without any, without any kind of uh, constraint violation being detected at runtime. Otherwise, it won't. Here's caller base. I told you caller base has one virtual function. Here's the virtual function. It's called R included by, because it reads fairly naturally when you see the, what the code looks like. Uh, it's a virtual function. It returns a boolean. So it's the body of R included by that is going to be generated using template metaprogramming. So because I can't get information using templates, I have to resort to runtime. So if I've got a virtual function, VF, I can pass in a reference to a caller base. So that's how the callee gets the constraints of the caller, which is exactly what we were doing before, except we were passing it at compile time rather than at runtime. So now, if a caller has access to some widget w, and it wants to call a virtual function on w like vf, here's the usual stuff that we still do. This can still be uh, a templatized function, because we can still do some com uh, compile time checking. And now, I pass whatever the normal parameters are, and then I create an object of type caller constraints object my constraints. This will cause the class caller constraints object templatized by my constraints that will generate the class. And part of the class generation will be an implementation for R included by, and there is um, support in the metaprogramming library for essentially saying do the following thing for each type in this container of types. And so what I'm going to say is do a dynamic cast of a callee object, which you haven't seen yet, for every one of the, for every one of the types in this type list. And if it ever fails, then uh, return false. I'm not going to show you that code, but I, I can, I'm happy to make that code available if you want to see what it looks like. It just it doesn't fit on three or four slides. So what a callee does. Well, we've got a function called create callee object that creates a callee object, which is kind of why I named it that. So here is the virtual function implementation. Here's the caller base object that comes in. So now I call create callee object, my constraints. This creates a callee object. And what's interesting about it is that I pass in my constraints. Now remember that my constraints is a list of types, a container of types to be a little bit more precise. What create callee object is going to do internally is it's going to create a brand new type that inherits 
from every type in this container and also inherits from call eBase. In fact, I think I'm going to show you that code. Let me take a look. Actually, okay, here's, here's create call eObject. I'll show you this in a second. So that creates an object of the appropriate type, which I then return, and I'm returning it as an auto pointer. Um, how many people here are familiar with scope guard? Good for you. I thought I was so clever. What I knew from scope guard is if you create an anonymous object like widget, okay, that's creating an anonymous object of type widget. And I bind it to a reference. So this creates an anonymous temporary widget object that normally would automatically be destroyed at the end of the statement. But because of craftiness on the part of the committee, if we immediately bind it to a reference to a constant widget, it magically has its lifetime extended until this reference goes out of scope. And I was thinking, this is exactly what I want to do. I want to create a call e object so I can pass it and use it for this one call and then have it go away. I thought I was so clever. So, it turns out that if instead of doing it this way, you do it this way, If I have a function f that returns a reference to a constant widget, returns a reference to a constant widget, thank you. And I say return a temporary widget. Here was my thinking. Hint, I would not be telling you this if it worked. <laughs> you create a temporary, you bind it to a reference to a const, which you then bind to a reference to a const, I thought, and now this temporary will live as long as this object here. And do you know, after only about two and a half hours, you can discover that that's just not true. <laughs> and what's kind of interesting is, is the, the standard is, is, how many people have read the standard, you know, like more than a paragraph at a time? <laughs> and, and lived? <laughs> For those of you who have not taken a look at the standard, my piece of advice is, and by the way, this is the same advice I give for reading the STL source code or read any meta program. Do not do it if you ever want to have children. <laughs> so, the standard actually is unusually clear about this. Um, what it tries to say diplomatically is, this won't work. Or as I read it the night I read it, Scott, you're an idiot. <laughs> so, anyway, it turns out that as a result of that, I had a lifetime issue problem, which was a joy to debug. Scott, yes? What you want to do is return the widget by value from that function. The way you have it right now, you're returning a reference to a local variable that's going out of scope. <laughs> if you return the widget by value, then it can work. Oh, cool. Okay. Great. No, that's a good idea. Thank you. Um, so the comment is that if instead of trying to be so clever as to return a reference to a constant widget, instead I avoided typing too much by just returning a widget by value, then it would work. That makes sense to me. So thank you very much all the, to try that. Um, but anyway, that's why the code that I have actually returns an auto pointer to one that's allocated on the heap is because I had a little lifetime problem. Thank you for pointing that out. So then I now have at this point I have a pointer to a callee base. Remember, this callee base object actually has a bunch of other base classes. So now what I can say is, I take the caller constraints object and I call the virtual function r included by. It, this function here knows all the dynamic casts it has to perform. I pass in the callee base object. It determines whether all the casts excuse me, succeed. And then I just negate that. So this is the runtime test. Any questions on how that works? <laughs> 
All righty. So this is how create call, the, uh, create call the object works. So the first thing I have to say is I want a new type of object who that inherits from every one of the types in the list of constraints and also inherits from call the base. And it turns out that the MPL has um, a meta function which will do exactly that. It is called inherit linearly. The resulting inheritance hierarchy is not linear. And it says, for every one of the types, create, it says, create a brand new type where one of the roots is called e base and where also in the hierarchy you will be inheriting from every one of the types in constraints. And this is magic. <laughs> I copied it out of the manual and it worked and I went, yes, and I quit. <laughs> Eric probably knows how it works. I don't. Um, and that's because at the time I was having tremendous amounts of uh, trouble trying to figure out when to put colon colon type at the end and when not to put colon colon type at the end. Um, I'm at the level of metaprogramming with, and putting colon colon type at the end that many people are at with using const in their code, which is I kind of put it in sometimes and if it doesn't compile, I take it out. <laughs> And sometimes I'll notice that it's inconsistently used, so I'll either add it in one place, remove it in another place, or I'll just pretend like I never saw it and move on to the next screen. So, unfortunately, that's, that's, I'm not proud of it. I'm just saying that's kind of where I am right now. Anyway, so this creates a brand new type, which I call constraints plus space. But this is actually a very convenient uh, call inside the MPL to be able to create an inheritance hierarchy with a type that inherits from all these types. Because once I'm done, I can just, uh, apparently what I should have just said is, well, uh, I should have just said return call e base. Uh, no, return constraints plus base that would create an object of this type. And if I return it by value, that would solve the problem. Thank you for that suggestion. Any questions about this code? Except for this line here. <laughs> so for virtual functions, you got two choices. You can use NVI or you can use RTTI. If you decide to go the RTTI route, then You've got virtuals declare an extra call the base parameter, excuse me, caller base parameter. That's what we're going to be using RTTI on. Callers uh, use color constraints object of my constraints <coughs> as that parameter. It's always what you pass. Callees use create call the object of my constraints and then pass the results who are included by. So again, it's pretty straightforward, can be macroized pretty easily. Any questions about the approach to virtual functions? Yes? Um, can you just ask you, like, who in the room uh, holds themselves to, like, NBI as a general standard? Uh, sure. Um, okay, the question is, how many people in this room generally follow NVI of having uh, virtual functions generally not be public and called through public wrappers? So, a few, I would say. Okay. So, first I showed you how to deal with non-virtual functions. Second, I showed you a way to deal, a couple of ways to deal with virtual functions. That's two ways. And there's some time for a demo. This is the third part, operators. I don't know how to deal with operators. Problem with operators is I can't pass them additional runtime parameters. There are syntactic restrictions. So I can't add a new runtime parameter. Now I can turn them into templates in general and I could pass additional uh, types during compilation, but I can't get the nice syntactic form of not having to use angle brackets. And somehow it's just not a big thrill to say operator plus of angle bracket my constraints angle bracket open paren a comma b. That's just not making me feel like I've got this great syntactic win on my hands. So, just out of curiosity, anybody have any suggestions on how to deal with operators? Yes. Couldn't you decorate the type of one of the arguments, make a little temporary object that holds reference to the real argument and also has all your extra constraint types? Maybe. Okay, the suggestion is to um, basically create a proxy for one of the arguments to the operator and then decorate that proxy with the constraints. That certainly sounds promising. It's a good idea. Like kind that. of weird looking, but maybe it'll work. So, um, 
Well, certainly it's, it's, be it's better than I don't know. So, <laughs> no, 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 I like that idea. So that, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. Any other suggestions? It's gonna look wicked weird on indexing, but still proof of concept. Um, so this is my experience, for what it's worth, on using template metaprogramming and the metaprogramming library. Um, I was already using three compilers. I was using VC8, I was using G++, I think 4.1, and I was using Como something, I don't remember. Um, in the meantime, my hard drive has crashed. I blame the metaprogramming library. <laughs> <laughs> so um, right now, I actually am only running one compiler, um, and so I can't really test it again right now. Um, I, there's a couple of things that are worth knowing if you were trying to play this game. One of them is, now, I was writing programs where if a constraint violation was present, then the user's program should not compile. And if a constraint violation was not present, the user's program should compile. So when I'm writing my little test cases, I would put in one where there was a constraint violation. And I would see, typically, Visual C++ would reject the program, yay me. G++ would reject the program, yay me. Como would compile the program without complaint. Now, if it were any compiler except Como, I would go, stupid compiler. But it has an EDG front end. And EDG is not wrong very often about the front ends. And this caused me a fair amount of Perplexment, perplexation, perplexity. perplexity. <laughs> Can I interest? You? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Until I remembered that the Como compiler, it does link time template instantiation. So if you only compile the code, you will almost never get an error on a template. It's only when you try to link it that you will get an error. So that was sort of an interesting variation. Um, I have to say now, there's probably somebody in the room who knows this. So VC8, this is what, either, is this version 14 of the compiler? Is it 14 or 13? One of the two, right? 14. 14. I have to say, um, I was fairly disgusted when I got an internal compiler error in version 14 of the compiler. I mean, I know it's a complicated problem, but I still have to say, really, the program should not be freaking out internally in version 14 on a program that's this long. That's, that's just me, I guess. Um, the metaprogramming library has an interesting approach to headers. Um, every feature in the metaprogramming library requires its own header. So for example, if you use inherit linearly, you have to include inherit linearly.hpp. If you, include, if you use contains, which is a meta function, you have to include, have contains.hpp. I spent a fair amount of my time trying to track down errors only to find out that I had failed to include the appropriate header file. Um, I really wish that there were a mpl.hpp that just gave me the entire metaprogramming library. There is no such header file. So if you play around with this, one of my first recommendations is make a header containing all the headers of the metaprogramming library. It, it will save you tremendous amounts of frustration trying to figure out why your one-line program is not working and giving you an error message that means nothing. It's because you don't have the right header file. Uh, similarly, trying to match up the angle brackets, um, I spent a lot of time trying to come up with some kind of a style for how to match up the angle brackets. I never did come up with something that was satisfactory. Um, so there's a certain amount of fiddling that goes along there. Uh, debugging is kind of a pain. There's no debugger, of course, for template metaprogramming because the program runs during compilation you would have to take a look at the compiler internals at compile time. Debuggers don't let you do that. So that's kind of a problem. Now, I didn't show you any of the code that does the, the generation of the dynamic cast, but that code is kind of weird because you write the code that performs the dynamic cast, but the metaprogramming library generates the code that calls your code to do the dynamic cast. So when you're trying to debug that, as you might be if, for example, an object had gone out of scope too soon, so it had already been destroyed and your dynamic casts were failing, for example. <laughs> to pick a random example. Um, it's kind of frustrating because 
you only see half the code you want. You want. You can't actually see the loop that's calling your dynamic cast. You just see each one of the casts. That's kind of weird. Uh, I already mentioned the current MPL release has bugs. Uh, there is yeah, somewhat limited documentation for the metaprogramming library. There's the online documentation. Uh, there's the book, neither one of which I would call great. Um, I think that they're both probably really good once you already know how to use them. They're essentially reference manual level materials is what I would say. On the other hand, I have to say that I got unbelievably helpful responses from the people on the Boost mailing list uh, when I basically groveled at their feet with my problems. And trust me, I did a lot of groveling. Um, my experience with Boost in general has been that the community is tremendously helpful. That certainly was my experience with the metaprogramming library. It was very, very helpful. I never, ever would have gotten this to, to work. And um, I have to say, I did sort of a, a little regression thing. I found myself doing something while working on this little project that I had not done in 30 years. This took me back to my childhood when I was programming. Because I'd write the code, and then I hit enter to invoke the compilers. And in that period of time, when you're waiting for the compiler to come up, and it's either going to accept your code, or it's going to reject your code, I would look at the screen and I would go, please work. <laughs> Basically, the metaprogramming library reduced me to prayer, is essentially what it was meant. <laughs> Um, this is my feeling about template metaprogramming. This has sort of often been my feeling about template metaprogramming for a while. Um, Alan Cooper in The Inmates Are Running the Asylum has this notion of dancing bearware. And he points out that, you know, people talk about dancing bears. He goes, the thing about dancing bears is they're not very good dancers. It's just that the fact that they dance at all is kind of remarkable. <laughs> this is my feeling about template metaprogramming. I have seen some truly interesting, useful things done with template metaprogramming. So I respect the results of template metaprogramming. But I really think that um, what people have to endure to make these metaprograms work is just unreasonably difficult. So um, I have a theory, which is that if we could easily parse C++, if there was an easy way to get in an API that would let you look at a C++ program, um, I think that would eliminate the motivation for lots and lots of template metaprograms. I think one of the reasons we do template metaprogramming is simply because the compiler is the only thing we have that can actually parse the language. That's one of my theories. Um, .NET has attributes, which essentially allows you to add custom pieces of behavior that can be enforced during compilation. At least this is my understanding. Uh, Java has annotations. If I wanted to implement the same behavior in a .NET language or in a Java language, rather than going through these weird syntactic machinations to make template metaprogramming do it, I would have been able to write stuff in the regular programming language in the form of annotations or, or in attributes that would have been much, much clearer and straightforward to express what I wanted to be able to express. So, um, you know, I think we're, I, I continue to think that, that uh, template metaprograms, in spite of the fact that we, you know, we're getting pretty good at shuffling around on the polar ice, uh, we're, it's still pretty much dancing bearware. Um, anyway, when the notes are available, you can take a look, and this is a place where you can read about additional stuff I talked about, and that's where I stole the pictures of the, the movie clips from. Are there any questions? Yeah. Uh, your constraint types, they are crazy distracts. Uh, yes. Are they using the reason that you are not using classes? Okay, the question is that my constraints are represented by structs. Is there any particular reason that I'm not using classes? Um, I guess the reason I, the, the first thing is they have no data. They have no functions. Um, the only reason they exist is to have an entity in the type system that allows me to talk about them. And so they don't, they don't need any encapsulation. And um, I, I personally chose structs because that's consistent with what they do in the standard template library implementation. So if you take a look at the way iterator tags are implemented, they're all implemented as structs. So I, essentially, I felt like I was following convention, but it wouldn't make any difference. Except you'd have to make those virtual destructors public for the dynamic cast to work. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, with const, you can determine whether the, there is a violation just by looking at the function declaration. But with your solution, you actually have to look, look at the function body. So you need to have that included. I was hoping for something that you could just take a prototype and look at it. And then you can have the, the function defined in a different module. <laughs> Okay, the, the comment is that um, you can look at the prototype for a function to find out about const correctness. 
in this case, you actually have to look at the implementation of the function in order to find out uh, what its constraints are, and you've been sort of hoping for something which would be in the declaration. I would love to be able to come up with a syntax that lets me do that. The closest thing I can think of is you could probably write a little script that would search for the my constraints line and then automatically insert it as documentation. Um, to be honest, I didn't spend a huge amount of time trying to figure out how to do that. Off the top of my head, my suspicion is there's no way to do that because the syntax of declarations is fixed, but that's off the top of my head. It's possible there might be some way to encode the type list as part of an extra parameter listed in the parameter list. But I'm not sure. I mean, I'd have to think more about that. Yeah? One place where it seems that the analogy with const breaks down is that you know, the compiler has a, it's not just const is some arbitrary tag, there's a semantics behind it. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like you know, it would be challenging to, to extend this for, certainly for arbitrary semantics um, in language extensions or something at some point. But do you, have you given any thought to any way in which perhaps for particular semantics, maybe things similar to what you do, would do with concepts um, would be, could be integrated with this approach? Um, okay, the question essentially is, is, th is there some way that I could think of to associate semantics with each one of these structs? I don't know because I haven't thought about it. My feeling is that you should be able to do anything you want to that is expressible in template metaprogramming, which means almost anything if you work at it hard enough, um, especially if you're willing to combine it with RTTI and, and, and stuff like that. So my guess is you probably could find a way to do that. But I did not think about that. I was just trying to, to get this much work. Yeah? I was wondering if you had seen any of the Windows SDK effort uh, to annotate function parameters. It had a slightly different goal than yours and a very different approach. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? The question is whether I've seen the Windows SDK way of annotating parameters. I have not seen that. Um, does it change the syntax of the language? Uh, it does not. It does not use templates. They insert, uh, I believe it's decal specs, and then they have a, a separate uh, checker that works. Uh, but does decal spec go in front of the parameter? Yes. We call that changing the syntax of the language. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, anyway. but the point is, they have a separate. Uh, they have a separate compile pass, and it's checked outside of the compiler, mm -hmm. as opposed to using the compiler to do the checking. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with that. Um, that's a, that's a variation on the uh, the comment that we don't have anything but the compiler that will parse. Prefast is just a different build of the compiler, oh, so okay. that tool is it's something that we've built internally for the compiler. Mm -hmm. So, the, the, I mean, in some sense, the interesting thing, let's put it this way, if you could parse, if you had a parser, then, um, I mean, you can use decal spec to change things. On the other hand, you can now, you can now start thinking about, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to associate um, a syntactically special comment, the kind like Doxygen uses or something like that, to associate that with a parameter and then I can do the checking that way. So once you've got a parser, then you can basically leverage any syntax you want to inside comments and try to fix things up. Um, it, it sounds like what they've chosen to do instead is to actually put a, a, a special syntactic marker in the parse stream. But I mean, you, you have lots of choices once you can do parsing. But anyway, to answer your specific question, no, I'm not familiar with that. Also, an idea for the how to move the uh, constraints to a header file uh, and the implementation back to a CPP is you can use the NDI in the uh, pattern where you have the template in the header and then it calls some internal uh, implementation. Okay, so the comment is we could use NVI. Um, that style of approach. Um, I, I would generalize that comment to say certainly what you can do is you can put the implementation of the functions in the header file because that's essentially what you're suggesting. Because if it's not a member function, for example, if it's a non-member function, the only way to, to, to document it in the header is to put the implementation in the header. But with templates, you typically do that anyway. Is that is that an accurate reflection of your comment? Well, I, I was suggesting you could call an internal function that's not in the header. But, but you still do the testing inside? Inside the header stub. Right, but what's in the, yeah, but the header stub, we have a word for stub. It's called function. <laughs> sure. I mean, the implementation is still in the header file, right? I suppose. I didn't think it through. So, no, I mean. I, I, if I understand you correctly, what you're essentially suggesting is that I'm so excited to have a new battery in this remote control thing. It wasn't working before. Where we say normal function body goes here, yeah. that could be a call to a function which is simply declared in the header and is implemented in the CPP file. Yes. So that the checking would be done in the header, but the actual body would go elsewhere. 
Yes, I agree. Yeah. Will there ever be something like C plus plus version two, which probably would include uh, this kind of this kind of thing? Okay, the question is, um, actually, let me split your question into part A and part B. So part A is, will there ever be a C++ version 2? Yes. Part B, that will include this kind of thing. No. <laughs> That's my guess. Um, they're finishing up work on C++ OX right now. They're, they're, last I heard, um, and, and, and Herb, are you still here? Yeah, okay. So are you guys still planning on having essentially a, a conceptually finished draft by the end of the year? Yes, October 6th. Yeah, I'm sure that's what's happening on October 6th. <laughs> and then hopefully a year later, a vote out a final stand for APIs, dotting the T's cross. That is an optimal schedule. It might slip by six months or a year, but we shouldn't do that. Okay. So, I mean, essentially, um, and Herb is definitely the person to talk to for the details on this. Uh, they're finishing up the work on what will be in the next standard for C++. I mean, it actually includes a ton of new stuff. I was really surprised when I, when I looked at the list. Um, but as far as I know, there's nothing even remotely similar to this, and there's no reason why there should be. Is that an accurate statement? Yeah, okay, so nothing about constraints and stuff like that. Was there a question or a comment over here? Yes? How would uh, uh, Alexander, who presented uh, class policies of this uh, modern uh, design, mm -hmm. how would that fit your uh, uh, approach? Okay, the, the question is, uh, how would Andre Alexandrescu's policies uh, be applicable here in, ter in terms of class design? Uh, I think that, yeah, I, I'm not going to put word in Andre's mouth because I don't know. Um, there's a couple things. We're dealing here with functions and not with classes, so there's a slight difference. Um, but in the same way that he encodes information using the template mechanism and then manipulates that during compilation, this is built on the same basic idea. So I think that the syntax uh, because I'm dealing with functions and he's perhaps dealing with classes, there's a difference there. But it, it's using the same underlying building blocks. Yeah. Um, so is, is, in your view, is C++ a language that's adaptable to like, these new um, you know, ways of uh, helping you program or whatnot? Um, as far as I know, I've, I've visited Herb on his talk with um, you know, sort of multi-threading and, and concept and stuff like that. In your um, talk here, like, is there? Do you have a preference in C++ just because you're used to it, um, or because it's, you know, easy to extend, or do you have, you know, like, is there a better language to sort of do these proof of concepts in? Um, I'm gonna really warp your question. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is this is not what he asked, but this is what I'm going to answer. So, <laughs> so the, the the warped version of the question. And depending on your attitude, either is, so, why did you do this in C++? <laughs> or, it could be, so, why did you do this in C++? <laughs> um, this is the language that I just happen to know really well. And um, I thought it was an interesting intellectual problem, and when I work uh, with people, I'm working in C++. So for me, usually, the choice of language is already decided. So I wasn't trying to figure out what would be the best language for expressing this kind of thing. I was trying to figure out, it almost was a, was a programming challenge, how can I get this kind of behavior expressed in this language? And I wasn't making any kind of value judgment as to whether this was a good language for it or a bad language for it. So um, I'm going to hang around for a while if anybody else has any more questions or comments. But a lot of you people, I think, probably had to work for a living today and should be allowed to go home. So thank you very much for coming.